Lord Krishna is describing to Arjuna that I spoke this knowledge to the sun god. The sun god gave this knowledge to Manu, the father of mankind. Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And in this way, the saintly kings understood the science of yoga. Lord Krishna was describing, was giving this information to Arjuna because he wants Arjuna to understand that he's not the, the first person to receive this knowledge from Lord Krishna. Previously, Lord Krishna had already given this knowledge to the sun god. It's significant that Lord Krishna mentions the sun god. Of course, Krishna has given this knowledge to many different people at different times. But he particularly mentions the sun god because the sun god is coming. He's the head of the line of Kshatriya kings. The Kshatriya kings come from the sun god or from the moon god. Lord, Lord Rama, uh, Lord Krishna appears in the line coming from the moon god. Said so when Lord Krishna appeared, it was the, the eighth day, but the moon was full. Lord Krishna is on the eighth, Janmashtami, has to be the eighth day. But because Krishna was appearing in the line coming from the moon god, the moon was full, the moon was joyous. So Lord Krishna is describing, he gave this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to the sun god, Vivishwan. Vivishwan is the head of the one line of Kshatriya kings, and Arjuna is a Kshatriya. He's coming in this line. He wants Arjuna to understand that this knowledge was not only for him, but it was given to many great kings in the past. 
who were all in the royal order. We can also understand the universal nature of the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. That it is not just simply for one class of people. It is not meant for just Kshatriyas, for example. But the message of Bhagavad Gita is for everyone. Later on, Lord Krishna will describe that Sriyo Vaishas Tatasudras Tepi Yanti Parangati that even we may be of lower birth. Women, Vaishas, Sudras, they can all attain the supreme destination. The, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is meant for all classes of people. Why did Krishna select Arjuna to receive this knowledge? Of course, this is was because Arjuna was both a devotee and a friend of the Lord. Therefore, he could easily understand. When Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita, he speaks it not only for the benefit of Arjun, but for all of us. The example is given that just as a, a mother will have to instruct the daughter-in-law. Now when a young girl is married and she comes to stay in the home of her mother-in-law, she will feel somewhat insecure in the home. <coughs> And the mother-in-law understands this girl is new in the home and she's going to be sensitive. So the mother-in-law is very careful not to directly instruct the daughter-in-law. But she will instruct her own daughter. And by instructing her own daughter, then there will be a, for the learning of the daughter-in-law. In the same way, Lord Krishna instructs his dear friend and devotee, Arjuna, not just for his benefit, but for the benefit of everyone in this age. The Lord has to come to re-establish the religious principles. As described in the fourth chapter, evam parampara praptam imam rajarsheo vidu sakaliniha mahata Yoga Nashta Parantapa. Yoga Nashta. The, the knowledge was lost. Krishna had established the line of disciplic succession. The knowledge was passed on, but in course of time, the knowledge was lost. Why was the knowledge lost? What happened? The problem came because people began to deviate. They began to change the message. Srila Prabhupada was very concerned that we would not change anything. He said uh, there was an, a, a very important incident. Srila Prabhupada's health was not good. And Prabhupada was planning to return to his home to native India and recover his health. So one of the devotees suggested that Prabhupada, since you're going back to India, can you send someone else in your place? So Srila Prabhupada thought for a moment and then very gravely he replied that if we change even one thing, then everything will be ruined. So Prabhupada was concerned that if one person was to come, and if they were to change anything, then it would ruin the whole effect of Krishna consciousness. It's such a, a delicate thing to deliver the message of Krishna. In course of time, it is natural that people want to, will want to change things. People think in the interest of growth, we should change things. Sometimes people suggest that 
Four regulated principles is too much. We should make it three. <laughs> we can have many more to do. Hmm? Sometimes people say 16 rounds of chanting is too much. You know, if I have to chant four rounds, you know, I could chant four good rounds, but 16 rounds is too much. <laughs> We should make it easier for people to become devotees. These suggestions come from time to time. Of course, it's true. If, 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 we did, if we didn't have any rules and regulations, you could have a lot of members. Right? But the result would be there would be, there would be no pure devotees. No one would, would ever be a pure devotee. The Krishna consciousness movement is a movement of pure devotees. Prabhupada was asked, apart from you, are there any other pure devotees on the planet? Srila Prabhupada said, how many members do we have in our society? So the devotee thought for a minute and said, well, there must be about 3,000 members. And Prabhupada said, then there are at least that many pure devotees. Devo. Prabhupada was saying that all the members of the Krishna consciousness movement are pure devotees. If we're following the principles of Krishna consciousness, if we're following the principles of cleanliness, mercy, austerity and truthfulness, then we're not doing anything sinful. We're not doing any, anything sinful, means we're engaging in activities which are pleasing to Lord Krishna. Pure devotees. Not that we're on the level of Narada Muni or Vyasadeva or Srila Prabhupada, but we're not doing anything sinful. There are different levels of pure devotees. Uh, well, anyone who is practicing the principles, chanting the holy name of Krishna, is a pure devotee. One who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands and the actions of anger. One who can control the urge of the tongue and the belly and gen genitals. Then can any accept disciples all over the world. So like this we can understand so if someone is accepting disciples, they're on some level of pure devotion. But that verse does not specify any particular qualification as a devotee, simply qualification as a madhyam adhikari, that he is controlling the mind and senses, that he has some knowledge, some understanding, has some faith, may not be 100% firm faith, it may not be perfect knowledge, but to some degree he's cultivating faith, knowledge, and he has some control over the senses. Now, Ms. Madhyam Adhikari. Madhyam Adhikari sees four different kinds of people. He offers his worship to the Supreme Lord. He associates with the devotees. He gives mercy to innocent persons, and at the same time, he will avoid atheistic and blasphemous persons. Madhya Madhikari has to make distinction. Sometimes people, sometimes people would uh, criticize devotees. Why don't you come and associate? Why don't you come with us? But we're very careful where we associate. When Srila Prabhupada was in indoor, Prabhupada was lecturing to the people there on the principles of Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada was describing, uh, Prabhupada was uh, attacking some people for misrepresenting the message of Bhagavad Gita. Many persons speak on the Bhagavad Gita 
but they use it to present their own philosophy. They do not present the message of the Gita in an authorized manner through the disciplic succession. So Srila Prabhupada was attacking, he was preaching against this uh, kind of prophet, this kind of preachers. So some, one man who was listening, he took some objection to Prabhupada criticizing people for misrepresenting the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada, he came to see Prabhupada and he said, how can you criticize people? Why are you always finding fault and complaining about people? He said, you should see everyone equal. But Prabhupada said, I am not on that level. Prabhupada said, I am not on that level of seeing everyone equal. On the Uttama platform, one will see everyone equally. One will not criticize or find fault with others. Because one is not preaching. The Uttama Adhikari general, generally sees that everyone is engaged in some kind of activities under the direction of Lord Krishna. But at the intermediate level, one makes distinction. And one will criticize, one may find fault and criticize. One will be careful to avoid the blasphemous and the atheistic. So Srila Prabhupada told the man that I am not on that level of seeing everyone equal. I don't see everyone equal. Therefore, I criticize people. However, later on this man, who had been, was critical of Srila Prabhupada, later on he talked to a devotee, and the devotee explained to the man that Srila Prabhupada was preaching the message of Krishna consciousness all over the world. And he was giving the message of Krishna to everyone. And in this way the man then changed his opinion of Srila Prabhupada and he came back and apologized to Srila Prabhupada and thanked him. He understood that Srila Prabhupada was doing the highest activity by giving Krishna consciousness because Prabhupada was delivering the message of Krishna consciousness to the whole world. At the same time, there was some distinction there that if somebody was atheistic or blasphemous, then we don't waste time trying to convince them of the message of Krishna. Rather, we want to look for the innocent people who are willing to hear. This age is called Kali Yuga. And the symptom of this age of Kali is quarrel, an argument and hypocrisy. We find it very difficult to live peacefully with each other. Even in the home there will be quarreling and arguing, disagreements. So Kali Yuga is the age of quarrel. And even over small things, little things become a major problem in the world. We have to be careful not to allow the agents of Kali Yuga to enter into the midst of devotional service. When we begin to quarrel with each other, this is a sign that we have allowed Kali to enter into our midst. How can we keep Kali out? We keep the, 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 rep, the agents of Kali out of our midst by strictly following the principles of Krishna consciousness, by fully engaging ourselves in the acts of hearing and chanting and remembering Krishna. We're also careful, just like in Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, that when 
Maharaj Parikshit met with the personality of Kali, he requested some place to remain. So Maharaj Parikshit told him, you can go wherever there is meat eating, intoxication, gambling or illicit sex. But the personality of Kali said, but there's nowhere where these activities are going on. Because you are ruling the planet and you do not allow any of these activities. So I have nowhere to go. So then Maharaj Parikshit gave a further concession. He said, then you can go wherever there is hoarding of gold. Because wherever there is hoarding of gold, there will eventually come quarrel and confusion. There will come so many problems will appear in the midst of that society. So this way, if we want to keep Kali out of our midst, we should be careful to utilize all of the wealth in the service of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada writes in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the principle of Krishna consciousness is that all the rich men should give half of their wealth to propagate Krishna consciousness. Right? To, put, to hold Sankirtan festivals and to glorify the Lord. <coughs> This is proper use of wealth, utilizing it for glorification of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada went to America with no money. He had only a few rupees. On the boat he was traveling on, he had his books, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which had been printed in India. He was able to sell one set of his books to the captain of the ship on which he was sailing. Captain Pandya purchased one set of his Srimad Bhagavatams and gave Srila Prabhupada, I think it was $20. Prabhupada calls it, it was, a, he said, a few hours spending in America. But Srila Prabhupada was not discouraged thinking that he had no money to propagate Krishna consciousness. Rather, Srila Prabhupada was confident that everything would be provided by the grace of Krishna because he was utilizing everything for the service of Krishna. He knew that Krishna would provide whenever it was necessary. We are also thinking now how we can how we can properly build this uh, wonderful temple which is coming up in the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the temple of the Vedic planet, planetarium. It is a very big project and it is very effective in capturing all the excess wealth of all of our devotees. <laughs> Let it it can all be used, all be put into the service of Krishna. Instead of agitating our minds with thoughts of sense gratification, we can simply give it all to Krishna. Now, this is proper use of wealth. Use it to build big temples for gorgeous worship of the Supreme Lord. But it is not required that we have to be wealthy, to be Krishna conscious. There are no material constraints in practicing Krishna consciousness. There are many devotees of the Lord who were very poor, but they were very rich in Krishna consciousness. We know, for example, Kolaveka Sridhar was a very wonderful devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He simply had a few banana trees. Whatever income he was getting from his banana trees, he would spend 50% of 
to worship Mother Ganges. And he did this on a daily basis. What, whatever income he got, 50% must go for the worship of Mother Ganges. Lord Chaitanya wanted to give blessings, benedictions to all of his devotees. And he asked his devotees, bring Sridhar. They didn't even know who Sridhar was. He was unknown to most of the followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya had to tell them how to find the home of Sridhar. Because Lord Chaitanya, as a young man, was going to the home of Sridhar and he would purchase some of the different fruits of Sridhar. And often he would play games and tease Sridhar. He would argue with Sridhar about the price, you know, accuse Sridhar of cheating him and trying to take advantage of him. So Lord Chaitanya sent the devotees to bring Sridhar. And when Sridhar came, Lord Chaitanya requested Sridhar, take some blessing, take some benediction from me. But Sridhar was, was saying, please bless me that I can go on as I am doing. That whatever income I get from my banana trees, I will spend half of it to worship Mother Ganges. He said, the bird lives in its nest in the tree and the king lives in his palace. Everyone is suffering and enjoying according to the results of the past deeds. What is the need for me to take some benediction from you to adjust my material situation? Just simply allow me to go on in my practice of devotional service. We see also Dhruva Maharaj. In the beginning, Dhruva was a Mishra Bhakta. He went off to the forest looking for a kingdom. But ultimately, he got the blessings of the Supreme Lord. And when he achieved perfection, when the Lord appeared to him after his six months of austerities in the forest, then Dhruva Maharaj had no more desire. Swamin Kritato Smi Varam Neyachi. Now I am fully satisfied. I don't want anything. This was the Dhruva Maharaj. This is the result of Bhakti Yoga. That every everyone becomes satisfied by service to the Lord. We see Gajendra also. In the, in the battle between the crocodile and Gajendra, Gajendra was at the point of death, but he remembered the mantra he had learned in his previous life. Because Gajendra, in his previous life, had been Indra Jumna. He'd been a great king, and he was engaged in meditation one day when some great sage came. And because he was engaged in meditation, he did not receive the sage. The sage therefore cursed him to become a dumb elephant. Indra Jumna became Gajendra. And Gajendra was fighting with the crocodile, and the, the, the Gajendra was almost at the point of death. His life was almost over when he began to recite the prayer which he had been remembering, which he had been reciting in his previous life. And the result was that the Lord appeared. Lord Vishnu appeared riding on the back of Garuda. Garuda. So when Lord Vishnu appeared before Gajendra, then Gajendra saw the Lord and he took a flower, took a lotus flower in his trunk and offered it to the Lord. He gave up his desire for... Uh, he, initially he was asking the Lord to protect him, to deliver him from his plight, from his uh, fearful situation in the clutches of the crocodile. But once Lord Vishnu appeared, 
he no he 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 lost that desire that desire was gone from his mind because he had become devoted his devotion had awakened so he had no more thought for his own bodily situation this is krishna consciousness in when we become conscious of krishna then we become indifferent to all of the different situations of this material world when we are conscious of krishna we simply think of how to please krishna and we're no longer concerned heaven or hell we see them all the same narayana para sarve na kutashchanya vidyate swarga apavarga narakesh bapi to yatadarshana for those who are devoted to lord narayan there is no difference between heaven and hell or liberation it is all the same because wherever the devotee goes they're th simply thinking of the lord they've taken shelter of the lotus feet of the lord therefore they don't make distinction between these different conditions of the material world material world our spiritual world it is all the same for the devotee for one who is krishna conscious this is the spiritual world where the, the pure devotees see krishna everywhere in everything lord krishna describes in the 6th chapter of the bhagavad gita for one who sees me everywhere and in everything I am never lost to him nor is he ever lost to me We all want to we all want to develop that kind of consciousness to see Krishna in everything in everyone to see the hand of Krishna in every activity in every event that is Krishna consciousness Sometimes people ask what does it mean to be Krishna conscious To be Krishna conscious means we will think of Krishna constantly We will we will not only think of Krishna but we will we will be seeing the hand of Krishna in every affair in every situation in every circumstance Being Krishna conscious is something we have to practice to come to that the probably explain just like the ability of a child to walk is there it's inherent in the young child but in the beginning the child cannot walk the child has to practice but with a little practice net because that ability to walk is there within the child in course of time the child will walk in the same way we can all become krishna conscious it is inherent within us to be conscious of krishna we have to cultivate that consciousness some practice is required and that consciousness will awaken first however we have to be conscious and then we have to become krishna conscious there are different levels of consciousness bodily consciousness mentally conscious physically conscious intellectually conscious and spiritual consciousness even in terms of spiritual consciousness there are also different understandings someone is conscious of the brahman simply see everyone is the brahman someone else is conscious of paramatma and others are conscious of bhagavan 
there are different realizations of the absolute truth. Supreme, the Supreme Consciousness, we say, is realization of Bhagavan, Bhagavan's teacher. One who knows the Lord as Bhagavan realizes also Paramatma and Brahman. Just as one who has 1,000 dirhams has 500 dirhams and 300 dirhams, it's all included within 1,000. In the same way, one who knows God as Bhagavan, as a personality of Godhead, also knows the Paramatma feature, and the Brahman feature. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes Manushyam nam sahasri chu kaschit jatati siddhaye yata tam api siddhanam kaschin mam vedita. Out of thousands among men, only one is endeavoring for perfection. Perfection means cities, yoga cities, material perfection. Someone has acquired some mystic power, they can walk on water. Or they can produce something from, from, some, from some far away place. They can make the body very light. Or they can make the body very heavy. They can perform wonderful activities, acts against the laws of nature. Yoga cities. That is material perfection. This kind of perfection has already been achieved by science and technology. Walking on water a yoga perfection. But for a few dirhams, you can take the boat across the water. You don't need to endeavor so much to walk on water. Just take a boat and play. So that yoga has the value of the boat ride. Whatever you pay for the boat ride, that's the value of your yoga powers. Not very great, right? Only a few people are endeavoring for that kind of perfection. Most people are not interested even in material perfection. And of those who have achieved material perfection, hardly one knows Krishna in truth. Devotee of Krishna is very, a very rare soul, a very rare person. Many people may know the impersonal Brahman. Well, not many, but a few. There are a few who know God as the impersonal Brahman, the all-pervading, as some light, some energy. But only a few rare souls know God as a person. It is easier, we could say, to understand God as energy or light. It is not so easy for people to understand that God is a person. This is Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is revealing to us that God is not just some light. He's not just some energy. Not only light, not only that, but He is also a person. Energy, light as a source. Whose energy? Where is that light coming from? We have to understand the origin of all of this. And the origin is in the original person. Lord Brahma prays, Ishtvara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha Anadhir Adhir Govinda Sarva Karanam That I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Krishna, who has a body of uh, eternal bliss and knowledge. He is the origin of all origins and the cause of all causes. So this is the position of Lord Krishna, Bhagavan. Hardly one knows him in truth. But it is, at the same time, Krishna says, I am easy to be known as son of Kunti. For one who is constantly engaged in my devotional service, I am easy to obtain. Not difficult. Other, by other processes, it is difficult. 
by the process of Gyan takes many lifetimes. We advance very slowly with great trouble, but through the process of Bhakti, it is very easy. Bhakti Yoga. This is the problem. People think it's too easy. You just put your hand in the bag and you chant the same mantra over and over again. Oh, it's too easy. I don't think it can be so easy, people say. Yeah, it looks easy, but it seems easy. Try and do it. And we see it's not actually so easy. Because it's not just only mechanical repetition of the same mantra, but there is quality also in the chanting. There is quality also in the service. There is uh, realization also in the, in the knowledge. It's not just simply academic knowledge, but there must be also some proper realization, understanding. So the path of bhakti, Krishna says, it, it is easy, but it requires constant engagement in my service, Krishna. This is the point. And that service we know must also be unmotivated. We shouldn't be thinking, what will I get? What's the result? The devotee gives selfless service. In this regard, Prabhupada tells the story about Krishna having a headache and the only people who want to give the dust from their feet to cure Krishna's headache are the gopis. The brahmins, they don't want to give it the dust from I won't get my liberation if I give the dust from my feet. They're attached to liberation, to their own salvation. But the real devotees, their service is unmotivated. They're not thinking, I'll get liberation. They're not worried about it. They're simply thinking about Krishna. How to please Krishna. What does Krishna want? What do I have to do for Krishna's pleasure? They give up all regard for their own name and fame, their position. They will give everything for the pleasure of Krishna. Krishna consciousness requires sacrifice that one will do even what we don't want to do. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjuna, he's going to fight. He's ready to fight even against people who he loves and respects. But he will do it. Why? Simply because Krishna wants him to do it. So, Krishna Consciousness is all about surrender, doing what we don't want to do, what, it, what, what seems so much trouble, so much inconvenience for us, but we're willing to do it for the pleasure of Krishna. When we are willing to, when we have that mood of service, then Krishna reciprocates. Because as we serve Krishna, Krishna wants to serve the devotee. And we see how Lord Krishna comes as the charioteer of his devotee Arjun, and as a messenger of Maharaj Yudhisthira, how he comes in the form of the sari to cover the body of Draupadi. In so many ways, Lord Krishna comes to blessed to, 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 to serve his devotees. But a devotee doesn't want to take service from Krishna. A devotee simply wants to give service to Krishna. It's more pleasing to give than to receive. We want, we want to give that service to Krishna. So Krishna consciousness is that eagerness, that enthusiasm to give service to Krishna. And that service should come particularly in the chanting of the holy name. That with great dedication and enthusiasm, we should call out the holy names of the Lord. Because this is very pleasing to Krishna. And Krishna himself came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
to teach all of us how to chant the holy name. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna.